welcome students as far as amendments in exercise is concerned i have prepared two videos in the first video certain amendments i have covered uh, what are the amendments i have covered there one was removal of goods at concessional rate of duty those rules have been amended so that one then input service distributor which is covered by rule 7 of sinvat credit rules that i have covered in that other video and all amendments in rule 61 62 63 64 and the procedure of 63a that has been covered in the other video in this video all the amendments in excise other than those amendments have been covered having said that let us start i am on page number 1 of the amendment material this is about bagasi before we study this uh, let us uh, remember something this is my factory if i am manufacturing two products final product 1 is dutiable and final product 2 is exempt and i am getting inputs excise duty paid input services service tax paid then how do you handle this situation uh, final product 1 whenever i clear on the value i end up paying excise duty and on final product 2 which is exempt on the value i end up paying 6% that is what we know normally now i am talking about other issue this is my factory i bring inputs input services using them i manufacture final product but in that process waste is also generated i sell final product then on selling price of the final product excise duty will become payable and whenever i sell west on the selling price also excise duty will be payable for the simple reason that west if it is movable if it is marketable if it is excisable and if west is result of manufacturing process if all these conditions are satisfied then you have manufactured a west also so value of west also excise duty will become payable point i will repeat again final product no doubt your excise duty liability but you have liability on west also if these four conditions are satisfied that west per se by itself west is movable west is marketable west is excisable and west is result of manufacturing process so if this is the process i am doing where i bring inputs excise duty paid i bring input services service tax paid which i use in the manufacture of final product then whenever i my sell my final product on selling price excise duty will be payable whenever i remove west two possibilities if west is dutiable then on value excise duty is payable but suppose west is exempt then like any other product on value of west also 6% will be payable last thing i'll repeat once again i purchase inputs excise duty paid i purchase input services service tax paid which i use in the manufacture of my final product but in that process west is also generated if that is true when i sell my final product on my selling price i will pay excise duty when i sell west there are two possibilities west is dutiable west is exempt if west is dutiable on the value i will pay excise duty but if west is exempt rule 61 of sinvat credit rule will equally become applicable and on value of west 6% will become payable this is the background now here is the case of bagasi this is all things which various circulars and instructions issued by cbc were explaining that on the value of west also because west you are able to sell it for consideration it is deem excisable goods and so on value of west also either excise duty will become payable or 6% will become payable that was the position as explained in all those circulars that have been referred to but in one of the case laws in fact one case law is in our ici case law book also that is uh, bagasi case law in bagasi case law Uh, court said that bagasi is not result of manufacture now please understand i said on value of west 
एक्साइज ड्यूटी विल बी पेएबल इफ वेस्ट बाय पर से इज मूवेबल वेस्ट इज मार्केटेबल वेस्ट इज एक्साइजेबल एंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इफ वेस्ट इज रिजल्ट ऑफ मैन्युफैक्चरिंग प्रोसेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन अ गिवन केस मैन्युफैक्चर इज ब्रिंगिंग इनपुट्स एक्साइज ड्यूटी पेड और इनपुट सर्विसेस सर्विस टैक्स पेड using them he is manufacturing his final product and in that process bagasi is also generated when he clears the final product also along with that he clears the bagasi also now on value of bagasi whether 6% is payable or whether excise duty is payable that was the question but court gave decision that bagasi is not result of manufacture and if it is not result of manufacture then neither excise duty is payable nor 6% is payable that was the position but as you know as you know rule 61 was amended and one explanation was inserted the explanation is read as follows for the purpose of this rule exempt goods or final product as defined in clause d and h of rule 2 shall include non excisable goods cleared for a consideration from a factory now when i clear the bagasi whether or not it is result of manufacture if i am clearing it from my factory still on the value either excise duty will become payable and if it is exempt then 6% will become payable so because of this explanation all these case laws now they are not required and all those circulars also not required so cbc has withdrawn all those circulars that is the amendment on page number 1 to repeat point once again the last the crux of it now explanation says even if you are clearing from your factory non excisable goods they will be given the same treatment like exempt goods so whether or not it is result of manufacturing process but if some non excisable goods are generated in the factory whether or not by the reason of manufacturing process when you clear them the non excisable goods from the factory even on the value of non excisable goods also 6% will become payable because for the purpose of rule 6 non excisable goods cleared from the factory will be given the same treatment like exempt goods so that is what is discussed on page number 1 page number 2 generally there is nothing great to learn here and not a very new kind of amendment but ek bar zara ye page ko samajhne ki koshish par what are the various duties that are payable and which all duties are exempt net net which all duties are payable as of now if you remember charging section 3 has created charge of basic excise duty if you are manufacturing excisable goods in india excise duty is payable basic excise duty and even today it is payable the second duty the charge of which was created by charging section 3 special excise duty has been completely exempted additional duty of excise goods of special importance this duty stands cancelled additional duty of textile and textile articles even this is exempt today national calamity contingent duty even today is payable education cess and secondary and higher education cess if you remember first march 2015 onwards basic excise duty rate was changed from 12 to 12.5% and ec and shsc payable on excisable goods was exempted so as a result as of today education cess and secondary higher education cess is not payable so ek bar zara view lete hain basic excise duty is payable special excise duty is no more payable tn uh, gsi is no more payable tnta is no more payable nccd is payable education cess is not payable secondary and higher education cess is not payable additional duty of excise the charge of which was created by finance act 2003 no more payable but additional duty of excise the charge of which was created by finance act 2005 which we popularly call it as health cess is payable clean energy cess the charge of which was created by finance act 2010 is payable infrastructure cess actually it is payable but it is not applicable for our attempt so we are not going to talk about it so what is the net conclusion if you are manufacturing excisable goods in india 
one three two thousand fifteen onwards only basic excise duty is payable, NCCD is payable, additional duty of excise, Finance Act two thousand five, health cess is payable, clean energy cess is payable, and infrastructure cess is not applicable to us. So one three two thousand fifteen onwards, basic excise duty, NCCD. Health cess and clean energy cess are the only taxes payable on goods manufactured in India. That is what I have summarized on page number two. Page number three is amendment in Central Excise Rule, Rule seven. As you know, if there is confusion about your excise duty liability, why there can be confusion? Confusion can be about value, or confusion can be about rate of duty. As a net result, if assessee is not sure about his exact excise duty liability, he can request provisional assessment to his to assistant commissioner or deputy commissioner having jurisdiction over his factory. And considering his case, assistant commissioner or deputy commissioner may allow provisional clearance of the goods at the rate decided by him. Once provisional assessment is resorted to, final assessment should be completed within six months. Period of six months in a particular case can be increased by commissioner by another six months, and chief commissioner can increase this period by the period he deems fit. If provisional assessment is less than final assessment, differential duty is to be paid along with 18% interest. If provisional assessment is more than final assessment, then you are entitled for refund at the rate of 6%, and for the refund, provisions of section 11B will become applicable. This is what. We have studied in Rule Seven, but as you remember, Seven Four was defective, and that has been amended. Rule Seven Four has been amended One Three Two Thousand Sixteen onwards. If you remember, there was one case law which we have discussed in RTP November Two Thousand Fifteen case laws. That case law was C Eight. In C Eight, the defect in Seven Four was brought forward. Let us re. re Repeat what we have studied in C8 case laws. For example, assessee's provisional assessment was done for the month of January 2016, and provisionally he has paid one lakh rupees. There was a possibility, either his liability is one lakh or his liability is two lakh. So he requested a provisional assessment, and his officer allowed. Provisional assessment at one lakh rupees, and this provisional duty assessee has paid. Now final assessment is yet not completed, but meanwhile some information become available to the assessee, or for whatever reason he is now of the opinion that final assessment will be completed at two lakh rupees. In between, he had some excess money he is in fund flow. So what he has done, even before final assessment is completed, as an advance, he has created one lakh rupees. To the credit of central government towards final assessment, I'll repeat. Provisionally, he has paid one lakh rupees. As of today, final assessment has not taken place. But assessee, out of some information or out of fear, has paid advance one lakh rupees, another one lakh rupees towards possible final assessment. Ultimately, for example, final assessment was completed in May 2016, and final assessment. Officer completed at two lakh rupees. Now, what is the liability of the SSC? Final assessment is two lakh rupees. Provisionally, he has paid one lakh. As an advance, he has paid another one lakh. So now, amount payable by him is zero. Seven four was wrongly drafted. Seven four it was written consequent to final assessment. If there is some liability, then SSC has to pay it with interest. Here, as you can understand, consequent to liability, SSC con consequent to final assessment order, SSC has no liability. In that case, in C8 case law, courts gave decision that no interest is payable. Actually, it was a wrong case law, and that defect in Rule 74 of Central Excise Rule Provisional Assessment has been now amended by doing an amendment in 74 effective 13 2016. What is written in the amendment? I will explain you with the help of one example. For example, assessee's assessment was completed provisionally for the month of January 2016. The confusion was 
the confusion was either it is 1 lakh rupees liability or it is 2 lakh rupees liability. SSC was provisionally assessed for the month of January and officer told him to pay 1 lakh rupees. You have to understand if it is liability for the month of January, SSC must have paid it to the credit of central government on February 6th. So on February 6th, he must have paid 1 lakh rupees. Now the story goes like this. For example, final assessment is yet not completed, but SSC has developed the fear that his ultimate liability is going to be 2 lakh rupees. Without waiting for final assessment and because SSC had some excess money in his fund flow, what he has done, for example, on 10th May, he has paid another 80,000 rupees to the credit of central government. Now, for example, on 20th of May, he has paid another 20,000 rupees to the credit of central government. Ultimately, final assessment took place. For example, and final assessment took place on, say, 10th of June 2016 and final assessment took place at 2 lakh rupees. Now, what is the liability of the SSE? Provisionally, he has paid 1 lakh. As an advance, on 10th of May, he has paid 80,000. As an advance, on 20th of May, he has paid 20,000. So, consequent to final assessment, his liability is zero. But whether any interest is payable and rule 7 newly amended says yes interest is payable interest will start from the next day to the due date that is February 7th on first advance it will be payable from February 7th up to 10th of May that is date of payment and on second advance also it will be payable from February 7th up to 20th of May now whenever you pay you have to pay with interest and pay. period starts from the next day to the due date till date of payment. Now, rule 7 has been completely rationalized. Please find amended rule 7-4 on page number 3. Next amendment is in rule 8 of central excise rule. If you remember, which I have given on page 4, if you remember rule 8 is manner of payment. Normally in excise, your January liability, you pay on February 5th or 6th. If you are SSI, then you pay quarterly. For April, May, June quarter, you pay your liability on 6th of July. For July, August, September quarter, you pay your liability on 6th of October, so on and so forth. So normally, SSE pays his liability on the next month. He pays monthly and in the next month on 5th or 6th, but SSI, pays it quarterly but for the month or quarter ending on 31st of March excise duty is payable on 31st of March that is what is given in rule 8 and there is no amendment but explanation to rule 8 was explaining us what do you mean by SSI the B portion remains as it is and that is the normal SSI what do you mean by SSI if value of goods cleared in the previous year is less than or equal to 400 lakh rupees then you are SSI and that has not changed but for specified goods I'll read it for you SSE engaged in the manufacture or production of articles of jewelry other than articles of silver jewelry but inclusive of articles of silver jewelry studded with diamonds ruby emerald sapphire falling under so and so chapters if his agreed value of clearance of all excisable goods for home consumption in the preceding financial year computed in the manner specified in said notification did not exceed rupees 12 crores. So for normal SSEs, you are SSI if value aggregate value of home clearances in previous year is less than or equal to 400 lakhs. But for specified articles of jewelry, you are SSI if your previous year is up to 12 crore rupees. That is the amendment in rule 8. Now, I am on page number 5. There is also one amendment in rule 9. If you remember rule 9, rule 9 was talking about registration. Who is supposed to register? Manufacturer, 
वेयर हाउस कीपर फोर फोर वाला स्टोर कीपर फर्स्ट स्टेज डीलर सेकंड स्टेज डीलर दीज आर एंड इंपोर्टर हु वांट्स टू इश्यू सिनवेटेबल इन वॉइस इनफैक्ट रूल नाइन ने बोला था यूजर ऑफ एक्साइजेबल गुड्स ऑल्सो हैज टू गेट रजिस्टर्ड बट रूल नाइन वी हैव ऑलवेज रेड अलॉन्ग विथ एग्जम्शन नोटिफिकेशन थर्टी सिक्स ऑफ टू थाउजेंड वन If you remember, if you are manufacturing of nil rate, if you are manufacturing nil rate yeah, exam goods, you need not register. Then, if you are manufacturer under section 65 of custom warehousing, you need not register. If you are a trader other than first stage dealer or second stage dealer, you need not register. If you are a principal manufacturer and your job worker is not working under 214 of 86, you need not register. All that portion we have studied in the class, and there is no. Uh, amendment there but the amendment is something different what the amendment says is that if there are you are a person who have more than two premises and those premises are located in the same area and on that area only one officer central excise officer uh, superintendent of central excise has the jurisdiction the processes done in those two units are interlinked you are not claiming area based exemption then and the goods transfer movement from one premises to another premises is properly accounted for then officer may allow you single registration that is the amendment isko ek bar padhte hai maine isko points mein convert karke bhi yahan pe likha hai ek bar main wo points padhta hu if two or more premises of the same factory there are two or more premises of the same factory are located within close area in the jurisdiction of superintendent of central excise where manufacturing process undertaken therein are interlinked so there has to be interlinked manufacturing process for example in one unit i am converting cotton into fabric and into another unit i am converting fabric into shirts so the manufacturing process undertaken there are interlinked units are not operating under area based exemption and subject to proper accountal and movement of the goods from one premises to other then officer may allow single registration that is the amendment which are which is on page number 5 which is an amendment to the notification 36 of 2001 page number 5 next amendment is in rule 11 of central excise rule here i have given full rule 11 which we have already discussed in the class rule 11 is basically about issue of invoice no excisable goods shall be removed from the factory unless accompanied by excise invoice excise invoice is to be prepared by the manufacturer what should be the format of that invoice how many copies should be there all that details we have already studied also along with that there were some amendments which we have studied last time the amendments was if is that possible that uh, goods are cleared from supplier's factory but they are directly sent to the job worker and invoice is sent to the principal manufacturer Th that was one amendment then is it possible that from supplier manufacturer goods are directly sent to buyer manufacturers but invoice is sent to the first stage dealer that was another amendment and then this these uh, all these three amendments we have already completed if you remember there was one more amendment that now excise invoice can be digitally signed it can be electronic invoice digitally signed that amendment also we have studied in the last attempt but in that if you remember transporter's copy was to be downloaded by the manufacturer and then he was supposed to authenticate it sign on that and give it to the transport operator if you remember invoice there are minimum 3 copies one is for the manufacturer his office copy one is for the buyer and the third copy is for the transport operator electronic invoice will suffice the purpose of the buyer and the supplier manufacturer but transport operator will always require hard copy reason is very simple transport operator collects the goods from the factory and he is moving towards buyer manufacturer in between excise officer stops him and ask for a valid document then transport operator needs a valid physical document so usme ek exception likh ke rakha tha it was written that manufacturer should take print out of transport operator's copy and he should self attest it but now the point is 
if it is digitally signed invoice what is the need of self attesting it was a unnecessary procedure so they have given away with that they have amended it is omitted from 13 2016 now transporters copy did not be self attested that is the amendment in rule 11 of central excise rule next amendment is in rule 7 rules uh, sorry next amendment is in rule 12 rule 12 is talking about filing of returns now 13 2016 onwards new return has been introduced annual return if you are a manufacturer maybe monthly or quarterly you will be filing a normal return along with that you will be also filing annual return after the year is over annual return is to be filed by 30th day of november next year so annual return april to march year is over by next 30th november you have to file annual return and annual financial information statement and annual installed capacity statement no more be filed also now the penalty which was payable is equally payable if you are filing annual returns late also also this uh, normal return as well as annual return now can be revised i think these are the points which are self explanatory here no value addition possible from me just read them now two returns you need not file one is annual financial information statement and one is annual install capacity statement and it is substituted by annual return if you remember service tax also annual return has been introduced though no format has been introduced the return has to be filed but abhi tak uska format bola nahi hai but now in excise also you can you have to file annual return also you, normal return as well as annual return you can revise that is given on page number 7 and page number 8 next i am on page number 9 if you remember as far as export procedure is concerned there are two options rule 18 and rule 19 rule 18 was rebate claim and rule 19 was bond procedure in rule 18 first procedure was how to get your inputs duty paid and for claiming rebate and that procedure was given by 21 of 2004 if you remember what was the procedure manufacturer will declare his input output ratio officer will verify his input output ratio if he is satisfied he may visit the factory and check actual manufacturing process or he may ask for the samples and he will satisfy himself about correctness of input output ratio then he will allow manufacturer to buy inputs duty paid and if you are getting your inputs under rule 18 final product also you have to export under rule 18 that was the procedure given by 21 of 2004 but now in that procedure there is one amendment if your goods are covered by si on sian then uh, chartered engineer certificate for correctness of ratio and input and output is also to be filed by the manufacturer so instead of only declaring your input output ratio you have to file chartered engineer certificate which authenticates the correctness of input output ratio in that case officer will accept it as it is and he will not do the verification of your input output ratio but still if he is not satisfied with the chartered engineer certificate he reserves the right to check your input output ratio i'll read that in addition to declaration a manufacturer will also have to file chartered engineer certificate for correctness of ratio of input and output where sion is notified the permission for manufacture and export of finished goods before commencement of export will be given on the basis of such certificate the procedure of actually checking of input output ratio by the officer is dispensed with but thus there will be no verification by acdc but in case but still if he is doubt in his mind still in case there is any doubt on the correctness of the declaration acdc may visit the factory so in the normal course officer will accept the chartered engineer certificate if he has doubts in his mind then only he will bother you to check the correctness of input output ratio that was one amendment in this notification also the other amendment now they have categorically written that 
you should not avail Sinovac credit. In Rule 18, you are going to take rebate of the excise duty that you have paid. In that case, you cannot avail Sinovac credit. Obviously, no, same cost ke do bar aap benefit nahi le sakte ho. And the third, uh, rebate claim ke liye 11B ka time bar applicable ho gaya hai. In other words, from the relevant date, 11B's time bar is one year. Same time bar is applicable for rebate application under Rule 18 also. So, now from the relevant date, you will have to make application for rebate within one year. That is the amendment. All these amendments are on page number 9. Page number 10 also, uh, almost same thing. Rule 18 ka jo export procedure tha. Uh, if you remember, what are the conditions to remove final product? First condition, for under Rule 18, what were the conditions that we have already studied? First condition that uh, goods shall be removed from the factory on payment of duty. Second condition was that after removal from factory, goods should be exported in six months. Third condition, if rebate claim is less than 500 rupees, then rebate will not be allowed. These were the, and market price of the goods should be, uh, the market price of excisable goods shall not be less than rebate claim. That is the, they were the condition. But here, what do you mean by market price? Market price means global market price, market price means price of the goods in the importing country or price of the goods in India. Now that word India has been added. So by here, by last we mean Indian market price of excisable goods at the time of exportation is not less than amount of rebate claim. So if Indian market price of the goods which you are planning to export is less than rebate that is claimed, then no rebate will be given. This was one amendment, the word Indian was added. Also, this we have just now studied. Here pe six months likha hua tha. You can make rebate claim within what period? Previously, it was written six months, but now the words have been changed to before the expiry of the period specified in section 11B. And as you know, 11B matlab one year. So that is the amendment in rule 18 procedure. Please complete page 9 and page 10. Next, I am on page number 11. There is one amendment in rule 26. Here I Two penalties मुझे याद है. एक था 11 AC वाला penalty और एक था rule 26 वाला penalty. 11 section 11 A में क्या लिखा था? If manufacturer, that is person liable to pay excise duty. So here 11 AC proceedings were possible only against manufacturer. What was the reason? Why show cause notice was issued? Short payment. Short levy, short uh, short levy, non levy, short payment, non payment, or erroneous refund. I will repeat karta 11 AK reasons to issue show cause notice was short levy, short payment, not levy, not payment, or erroneous refund. Rule 26. Achha, or 11 AC may by issue of show cause notice, officer was going to recover duty, interest and 11 AC was talking, 11 AC was talking about penalty. Penalty there in innocent cases was 10% or 5000 whichever is great or uh, for fraud cases it was 100%. This penalty was subjected to certain reductions. We have studied that in 11 AC. Simultaneously, Rule 25, Rule 25 also is talking about some penalty. But here, he is talking about confiscation and penalty. And what are the offenses? They have been given by A, B, C, D. Here on page number 11, I already reproduced Rule 25. But most important things if you see, first we will read the offenses. Remove any excisable goods in contraventions of any of the provisions of these rules or the notification issued under these rules does not account for any excisable goods produced or manufactured or stored by him, engages in manufacture or production or storage of any excisable goods without having applied for registration 
contravenes with any of the provisions of these rules or notifications issued under these rules with intent to evade payment of duty and who is the person doing offense producer or manufacturer registered person of a warehouse importer who issues excisable invoice registered dealer ek bar main basic difference between the two penalties discuss karta hu 11 ac was only possible against manufacturer rule 25 is possible against manufacturer against first stage dealer against second stage dealer against warehouse keeper against store keeper and in fact against the importer who is issuing cenovatable invoice here 11 ac the reason was short levy short payment not levy not payment of erroneous refund here there are so many offenses 11 ac all what you are asking is penalty equal to 10% or equal to 100% Rule 25 is talking about confiscation of goods and penalty. Penalty will be what is the penalty here? Penalty will be equal to duty or 5000 rupees whichever is greater. To conclude, 11 AC was only talking about penalty. Rule 25 is talking about confiscation and penalty. Also, 11 AC was only possible against manufacturer. 25 is possible about so many people. but rule 25 is subject to section 11 ac if you read the opening line rule 25 is subject to 11 ac in other words if officer has already started proceeding under 11 ac and he is demanding penalty under 11 ac rule 25 penalty cannot be demanded now officer can use rule 25 only for confiscation of the goods conclusion if officer has already started recovery proceedings and if he has already asked for penalty under 11 ac now double penalty under rule 25 not possible still officer can confiscate goods under rule 25 okay but that is again rule 25 which was about all these people but what if a transport operator was party to the contravention the, you are a transport operator you knew that the goods which you are picking up for delivery the goods which are trying to remove from the factory are the goods against which offense has been done one of these offense a b c d e wala a b c d wala offense hai what i am trying to say what about a transport operator who has reason to believe that the goods that he is carrying the offense has taken place then rule 26 takes care of that read rule 26 rule 26 says any person who acquires possession of or in any way concern in transporting removing depositing keeping concealing selling purchasing or in any other manner deals with any excisable goods which he knows or has reason to believe are liable for confiscation under the act or the rules shall be liable to a penalty not exceeding the duty on such goods or 2000 rupees whichever is greater so if the proceedings are against manufacturer rule 25 if the proceedings are against transport operator it was rule 26 now in rule 26 they have made one amendment i read that amendment for you provided that where any proceeding for the person liable to pay duty has been con- concluded under clause a or clause d of subsection 1 of section 11 ac of the act in respect of duty interest and penalty all proceedings in respect of penalty against other person if any in the said proceeding shall also deemed to have been concluded simultaneously officer has started proceedings against manufacturer and against transport operator but officer was able to recover duty interest and penalty from the manufacturer then he will drop the proceedings against transport operator this is the amendment which has been inserted from 1st march 2016 please read page number 11 now i am on page 12 uh, this is going to be a very important amendment uh, last time we said we, i am talking about ssi uh, export to usa is not for home clearances export uh, dta is all uh, home clearances 
but there was one exception. Last time we said export to Nepal and Bhutan will be considered as clearances for home consumption for the purpose of this notification. From that Nepal word has been deleted. So now I say export to Bhutan will be considered as clearances for home consumption for the purpose of this notification. Export to Nepal will be considered like any other exports. So that is the amendment which we have I have given on page number 12 and this is applicable from 1-3-2016. Please understand page number 12. Now I start with some amendments in Sinovat credit rules. The first amendment is in capital goods. If you remember what is capital goods? All goods falling under chapter 82, 84, 85, 90, 68.04, 68.05 to that list wagons of subheading number 860692 has been added. We have to remember it as it is to this list of 82, 84, 85, 90, 68.04 and 68.05 a new item has been added wagons falling under subheading number 860692 will also be treated as capital goods that is the first amendment second amendment last time if you remember we said that all these capital goods if they are installed in factory they will qualify as capital goods but moment you have installed one of them into office within the factory it will not qualify as capital goods that condition has been removed effective 1 4 2016 a computer if I install it on shop floor in my factory still it will qualify as capital good and the same computer if I install within my office within the factory still it will qualify as capital goods. The condition that if you install those capital goods in office it will not qualify as capital goods that condition has been omitted. Very good for industry. Also if you remember for manufacturer capital good will qualify as capital good subject to condition that it is used within the factory use within the factory was compromised only for one purpose. What was that purpose? It was used at that place where it was used for generation of electricity and that electricity is captively consumed. Then though it is not used within the factory still it qualifies as capital good. To that one more exception has been added. If it is a water pump I will explain. In my factory, I need lot of water in my manufacturing process and water is short. There is a water reservoir adjoining. So what I have done, I have set up some pumps there. Those pumps pump the water and it is sent to the factory. And all that water is captively consumed. Then even those water pumps will qualify as capital good. What has been compromised is used within the factory. So to conclude, now use within the factory has been compromised for two purposes. One, if it is used at that place for generation of electricity which is captively consumed or it is used there for pumping the water and that water is captively consumed. Both these cases, though it is not used within the factory, still it qualifies as capital good. So that is the second amendment. So in all, there are three amendments in the definition of capital goods. Exam service definition. Also, there is one amendment. Pahle yaad karte, pahle kya likha tha? 93.1 ya 93.2 ke andar notification issue hone ke karan, agar ek particular service hai, to hum usko exam service bolte hai. That was the first part. Charging section ne negative services ko charge se exclude kar diya hai. For the purpose of Sinovat credit, they are also exam services. That was part two, which we have already studied. But taxable services Achha, third part was uh, if abatement is allowed subject to denial of senior credit of both input and input services that was also an exam service but shall not include export of service as per rule 6 a of service tax rule yahan tak humne last time padha tha usme point number b add hua hai what he says let us read that english first exam service shall not include I am reading in conjunction exam service shall not include a service by way of transportation of goods by vessel from custom station of clearance in India to place outside India I will explain this is Indian shipping company 
this is Indian shipping company, what service they have provided, some exporter wanted that his goods be lifted from Indian port and dropped at South Africa port and transportation of goods is going to be by vessel. What is the service provided by shipping company? They are going to take goods of an exporter from Calcutta port and they are going to transport it to South Africa port. Service provided by shipping company is transportation of goods by vessel. For this service, POP rule will become applicable and what is the destination of this, uh, what is the POP of this transaction? POP will be destination of the goods. Destination of the goods is South Africa. So POP will be South Africa, which is in non-taxable territory. So on this service, there is no service tax liability. And because there is no service tax liability, this service will become exempt service. In turn, Sinovac credit will not be available. But if Sinovac credit is not available, what the shipping company will do, they will add it to their cost so as to provide this service if shipping company is buying some inputs, excise duty paid or buying some input services, service tax paid and if the, this service is exempt service, then Sinovac credit will not be available. In turn, shipping company will add this excise duty, add this service tax to their cost which will increase cost of the service. In turn, export price will increase which is not good for us. So now they say, now they say are you providing a service of transportation of goods by vessel from custom station of clearance in India to place outside India? I know you are not paying service tax but still your service will not be treated as exam service. In other words, Sinvat credit will be available to you. That is the amendment. This is amendment to reduce the cost of shipping companies and to make them globally competitive. That is the amendment in exam service point number B. In the definition of input also there are some amendments. First amendment is about pumping of waters. Abhi abhi humne bola tha because of the water, sh water shortage, what I am doing, I am pumping the water from an adjoining water reservoir. I have installed some capital goods there. Now, so as to run those capital goods, I require some inputs. Whether those inputs will qualify as input for the manufacturer. As you remember, for the manufacturer, articles will qualify as input only if they are used within the factory. If they are used outside the factory, normally they will not qualify as input. This use within the factory for inputs was compromised only for one purpose before. Now it is compromised for two purpose. So total amendments ke saath mein explain kar raha hon. There is one other place where I have installed some machines. Which machines I am generating electricity and that electricity is captively consumed or wo jaga pe so as to run those machines if I use some inputs though inputs have not been used within the factory still they will qualify as inputs for me so use within the factory was compromised if they were used in generation of electricity and electricity was captively consumed now same has also been allowed for pumping of water to conclude at that place I have set up some pumps now I have brought some inputs which have been used to run those pumps. They have been used to run the pumps and the pump has pumped the water and that water is captively consumed. Then though articles are not used within the factory, still those articles will qualify as input. To conclude, use within the factory for input also has been now compromised for two reasons. One used at that place for generation of electricity and electricity is captively consumed also it is used at that place for pumping of water and water is captively consumed. In both the cases, though they are not used within the factory, still they will qualify as input. That is one amendment. Second amendment, if you remember, uh, capital goods cannot qualify as inputs. But if capital goods have been purchased and value is up to 10,000 rupees per piece, now they can qualify as input. So if it is capital good up to 10,000 rupees per piece, manufacturer can treat them as input and take 100% Sinovac credit. Both these amendments are applicable from 1-4-2016. Also, excludes mein usne likha tha. Last time humne padha tha, 
if it is a capital good it cannot qualify as input that was the portion which we have studied as c usme ek exception tha wo kya exception tha jo last time tak pada tha please understand ye mera factory hai today i have purchased a computer computer is falls under classification of capital good but what i am doing with this computer i am manufacture furnaces on this furnace for temperature control i have to fit in one computer so ye jo computer maine buy kiya tha i fit it on my final product and when i clear my final product along with my final product capital good is also clear in that case this computer will not be treated as capital good and it will be treated as input to pehle wo bol raha tha excludes portion mein exclude portion portion mein pehle wo bolta hai capital good cannot qualify as input fir usne ek exception likha tha if capital good is such which is cleared along with the final product then it is not capital good for you it is input for you now to that he has added one more thing is it a capital good up to value of 10000 per piece then it is not capital good for you it is input for you so to match with the this amendment this amendment was necessary so he has done it actually both these amendments are to be related to each other so there are in all three amendments in the definition of input please go through that which i have given as page number 15 next amendment is in the definition of input service and it is one of the most important and expected amendment in my case law lectures the introduction to case law lectures i have already explained this amendment in detail listen to that video where i have explained it better yahan pe main usko short mein explain karta hu i will repeat what i said just now my first lecture on case laws which i have named as introduction to case laws there this point i have explained very nicely yahan pe usko short me repeat karta hu whether sales commission will qualify as input service there were n number of case laws where based on analysis of means portion of input service and analysis of include portion of input service courts had given the decision that sales commission will not qualify as input service but which was not good for industry certainly unless you have incurred sales commission you cannot increase your sales so sales has something to do with your business and actually sales commission should qualify as input service that was the industry demand which was true also so now they have taken care of that 3rd february 2016 they have amended definition of input service and one explanation has been inserted i'll read that explanation for you for the purpose of this clause sales promotion includes services by way of sale of dutiable goods on commission basis categorically they have added categorically they have made it point blank clear that sales commission will qualify as input service that is the amendment in the definition of input service on page 16 now i am on page number 70 rule number 7b has been newly introduced ek bar usko pehle padhte hain distribution of credit on inputs by a warehouse of a manufacturer please remember here the word warehouse has been used generally we are not referring to rule 21 warehouse rule 20 sub rule 1 if you remember warehouse some goods are notified then you can remove those goods from your factory without payment of excise duty and transfer to warehouse we are not talking about that warehouse here we are not talking about rule 20 warehouse the word warehouse has been used very very generally distribution of credit on inputs by a warehouse of a manufacturer a manufacturer having one or more factories shall be allowed to take credit on inputs received under the cover of an invoice issued by the warehouse of the said manufacturer who receives input under cover of documents specified in rule 9 towards the purchase of such inputs the provisions of these rules or any other rules made under excise act as applicable to first stage dealer or second stage dealer shall mutatis mutandis apply to such warehouse of the manufacturer i'll explain 
I have three factories. Factory one, factory two, and factory three. For example, I have three factories, and all these factories require so many inputs, and some of them are common inputs. It always makes sense if purchase is centralized. So what I have done, I got this place. I call it a warehouse. It's the place where I have centralized all my purchases. Whenever inputs are required, either at factory one or at factory two or at factory three, they are centrally purchased in a warehouse. You know the advantages of centralized purchase. You may get quantity discount. You may get better paid payment terms, and you may get expertise benefits of skills and expertise. So all my purchase department is centralized here. Inputs required at factory one, factory two, or factory three. they will be received here so sinovat credit i cannot say avail it will be booked here by some accounting entries and by some documents it will be transferred for example if 10000 units are purchased at the rate of rupees 10 that makes it total 1 lakh rupees on which excise duty is paid 10000 and they have been centralized purchase at warehouse out of that 6000 had been sent to factory 1 3000 have been sent to factory 2 and 1000 will be sent to factory 3 for example he has purchased 10000 units at the rupees 10 each total purchase of 1 lakh on that excise duty paid is 10000 out of this 10000 units 6000 factory 1 6000 3000 factory 2 1000 factory 3 by one to one correlation 6000 rupees sinovat credit will be transferred on factory 1 Three thousand rupees sinovat credit will be transferred on factory two. One thousand rupees sinovat credit will be transferred on factory three. He says, warehouse keeper, this person will act like first stage dealer. Based on the invoice of purchase, he will receive sinovat credit and he will pass on to factories. And because it is first stage dealer, he will be registered as first stage dealer. All provisions of Central Excise Act and rules made there under. regarding first stage dealer will become applicable to him so like first stage dealer he will do one to one correlation this unit is sent here uska sinovat credit idhar bhej do this unit is sent here uska relatable sinovat credit idhar bhej do he will do one to one correlation and distribute that credit over the factories yahan pe wo bolta hai 7b mein pehle wo bolta hai ki aap ye kaam kar sakte ho aur 7b2 mein wo bolta hai you will like you will have to function like first stage dealer or second stage dealer and all the provisions of first stage dealer and second stage dealer under this act and rules will become applicable to you so you'll have to register yourself you'll have to maintain books of accounts you will have to file the returns of this warehouse that is what it's saying uh, this is just to handle the practical difficulties faced by the industry where there is a centralized purchase department kind of situation that is rule 7b newly inserted from 14 2016 ek bar ek interesting situation jara dekh lena which may be converted into a question three rules we have studied rule 7 rule 7a and rule 7b rule 7 was talking about input service distributor rule 7a is talking about uh, rule 7a is only talking about service provider and rule 7b is only talking about manufacturer rule 7 was applicable to manufacturer as well as service provider rule 7a is applicable only to service provider rule 7b is applicable only to the manufacturer rule 7 we were talking about distribution of sinovat credit of input service rule 7a was talking about distribution of sinovat credit of capital goods and inputs and 7b is talking about distribution of sinovat credit only of inputs teen rules ko ek bar comparative study karo then you will be able to understand all these three rules better if you remember rule 7 we were talking about input service distributor who on the based of invoices of service provider is availing sinovat credit and distributing it over his factories or premises Rule seven was only talking about availment and distribution of sinovat credit of input service, 
and rule 7 was applicable to manufacturer as well as to service provider. If you read rule 7a, he is talking about availing Sinovac credit, not availing, booking the Sinovac credit of excise duty paid on inputs and capital goods by the office of service provider. So 7a was basically talking about capital goods and inputs and rule 7a is only talking about service provider, it is not talking about manufacturer. Rule 7a is talking about booking Sinovac credit of excise duty paid on capital goods and on inputs which was to be distributed by service provider on his premises. Rule 7b is only talking about booking Sinovac credit of excise duty paid on inputs and its distribution over the factories. So 7b is only talking about inputs and is only talking about manufacturers. A comparative study may make you easier for you to understand these three rules. Please complete page number 17. Page number 18, what all Sinovac credit is available? That is given by rule 3.1. Usme ek ship breaking industry ke liye ek proviso tha. If you remember, my business is ship breaking. Pure dunya mein koi bhi tuta futa vessel hai, toh mein buy karta hoon. Aur usko mein import karta hoon. और उसमें मैं सामान बना के बेचता हूं माय बिजनेस इज शिप ब्रेकिंग इंडस्ट्री सो व्हेन आई इंपोर्ट टूटा फूटा वेसल आई विल एंड अप पेइंग ऑल इंपोर्ट ड्यूटीज आई विल एंड अप पेइंग बीसीडी आई विल एंड अप पेइंग 31 आई विल एंड अप पेइंग ईसी ऑफ कस्टम एसएचईसी ऑफ कस्टम एंड 35 इसमें से मुझे क्रेडिट किस-किस का मिलेगा बीसीडी नो क्रेडिट अवेलेबल ईसी ऑफ कस्टम नो क्रेडिट अवेलेबल एसएचईसी ऑफ कस्टम नो क्रेडिट अवेलेबल सो आई शुड हैव बीन अलाउड क्रेडिट ऑफ ओनली 31 एंड 35 वहां पे गवर्नमेंट ने ऑब्जर्व किया था शिप ब्रेकिंग इंडस्ट्री वाले जो लोग काम करते हैं उसमें 85% प्रोसेस ऐसे है वेयर प्रोसेस अमाउंट्स टू मैन्युफैक्चर सो इसके जो प्रोडक्ट बनते हैं उसके ऊपर दे आर पेइंग एक्साइज ड्यूटी but 15% process I say hai, where process does not amount to manufacture. So when they sell it, they don't pay excise duty. I will explain you. I have a footage ship import. I have a chandelier. I have a chandelier clean. Karke bech diya. Now I am talking about 15% processes where process does not amount to manufacture. I have not manufactured that chandelier. So when I sell that chandelier, on selling price, I am not going to pay excise duty. Government ne observe kiya, ship breaking industry mein 85% process ke upar wo excise duties pay karte hai, 15% process ke upar wo excise duty nahi pay karte hai. So they made a proviso in 3.1, if uh, you are a ship breaking industry, you will get Sinovac credit only of 85%. Now that proviso has been omitted. You can get 100% Sinovac credit. Are you able to relate this to something? Are you really benefited or there is a catch in this? I will explain the catch. Imported vessel, 3.1 ka 100% credit le liya, 3.5 ka 100% credit le liya. If process amounts to manufacture on the value, I will pay excise duty, process which does not amount to manufacture will be considered as clearance of non-excisable goods. Do you remember amendment to rule 6.1? For the purpose of Sinovac credit rules, non-excisable goods will get the same treatment like exam goods. So 6.1 becomes applicable to me. I am manufacturing exam goods also. I am clearing from my factory non-excisable goods. For the purpose of rule 6.1, non-excisable goods will be given same treatment as exam goods. So on non-excisable goods which I will be selling, on their value, 6% will become payable. There is no benefit actually. Yahan se diya, yahan se leke gaye. So this is just a very interesting uh, amendment. 
so just take care of that please understand actually ship breaking industry has not been benefited now instead of taking 85% credit they will be allowed to take 100% credit but whenever they clear the goods of the goods where process does not amount to manufacture that will be considered as clearance of non excisable goods from the factory and on the value 6% will become payable so that is the amendment here on page number 18 I have shown that amendment separately which is effective from 1st March 2016 and also the repercussion of 6% I have given here at the bottom of this note. Please complete study of page number 18. Now I am on page number 19. What is one to one correlation that we have studied as rule 3-4. Now there are two provisos here. One proviso says that Swachh Bharat says Sinovac credit is not allowed and for paying Swachh Bharat says liability you cannot use other Sinovac credit. So first proviso says provided also that Sinovac credit of any duty specified in sub rule 1 shall not be utilized for payment of Swachh Bharat says. Swachh Bharat says you have to compulsorily pay it in cash that is this proviso also provided also that Sinovac credit of any duty specified in sub rule 1 except national calamity contingent duty in item 5 thereof shall not be utilized for payment of for not be utilized for payment of national calamity contingent duty levyable under 136 of finance act. NCCD also has to be paid by using NCCD credit only. That is the another amendment. First amendment me wo bolta hai, available Sinovac credit in your books cannot be used for paying your SBC liability. Second proviso me, second amended proviso me wo bolta hai ki NCCD can be paid only by using NCCD credit. Ye dono ko padne ke baad, effective 14 2016. What is the new one to one correlation? I have given it on page number 20 and this is going to be very simple to remember now. Whatever is your credit of basic excise duty, chalo usko jara baad mein padte. NCCD credit can be used only for NCCD liability. Health says credit can be used only for health says liability. So basic excise duty can be used only for basic excise duty other than one of 2011 and for service tax liability. 3-1 studied separately. 3-5 can be used for basic excise duty other than one of 2011. If you remember, 3-5 credit cannot be used for your service tax liability. Service tax liability can be used for basic excise duty other than one of 2011 and for service tax liability. As far as 3-1 is concerned, there are two components in 3-1. One is BD component and one is NCCD component. NCCD component can be used only for NCCD liability and BD credit can be used for BD liability other than one of 2011 or for service tax. One thing we have to remember, clean energy says SBC always is to be paid by cash. Infrastructure says we are not talking about. So one conclusion is that clean energy says and SBC always is payable by cash. One to one correlation now made very simple. Please understand page number 19 and page number 20. Now I am on page number 21 of my amendment material. 4.2. This amendment is very simple. Uh, capital good as soon as you have received you can take 50% Sinovac credit. Balance 50% Sinovac credit you are supposed to take in the next financial year. To this rule of 50-50 there are three exceptions. One of the exception was SSI. And what do you mean by SSI? If value of clearances in the previous year is less than or equal to 400 lakhs then you are SSI normally but as you know for specified jewelry items you will be considered as an SSI if value of clearance is up to 12 crores so normal is given by point number 2 there is no amendment there normally we call you SSI if previous year does not exceed 400 lakhs but for specified items of jewelry if previous year does not exceed 12 crore rupees that is the amendment on page number 21. 47, very, very important amendments. And in 47, there are three amendments. Amendment number one, 
amendment number two and amendment number three. Amend number amendment number one first. If you remember, after invoice is received, immediately you can take Sinovac credit. If you are not able to take it on the same day, can you take it on next day? Yes. Can you take it next week? Yes. Can you take it next month? Yes. Is there any time limit? Yes. One year from the date of invoice. If Sinovac credit you have not taken within one year, it will lapse. That is the normal provision. But this provision is not applicable to services provided by government or local authority or any other person by way of assignment of right to use any natural resources. The time bar of one year not applicable to specified service. And which is that specified service? Is it a service provided by government or local authority or any other person to a business entity? And is the service assignment to use uh, assignment of right to use natural resources, yes, then time limit of one year is not applicable. What is the reason behind this? Immediately understood in the next proviso. Next proviso, first without the proviso, as soon as, invite, as, soon as invoice is received under 47, immediately you can take 100% invite rate of input service. Normally, yes, but is it service provided by government, local authority or any other person and is it assignment of the right to use natural resources, Sinovac credit will be allowed in three equal installment. I will repeat the important point once again. Normally, as soon as invoice is received under rule 47, you can avail 100% of the Sinovac credit. But are you talking about service provided by government, local authority or any other person to a business entity where service is assignment of right to use natural resources, Sinovac credit will be available in three in equal installment. Immediately one third, next financial year one third, next to next financial year one third. Remember here service provider can be government local authority or any other person what why this any other person we'll talk about it after we read third proviso provided also that where the manufacturer of goods or provider of output service as the case may be further assign such right assigned to him by government or any other person in any financial year to another person against consideration such amount of balance in that credit as does not exceed the service tax payable on the consideration charged by him for such further assignment shall be allowed in the same financial year. So the assignment of right you got, whatever service tax you have paid under reverse charge, Sinovac credit was allowed one third, one third and one third. But before uh, the third year, in between only, if you have sub assigned it, then balance Sinovac credit will become available immediately. What is trying to say is like this, government or local authority, for example, has provided service logically to a business entity, here I will call it A limited and value was 1 lakh. For example, it has to be 100,000 crores, but it is assignment of natural resources and value is 1 lakh. Ignoring service, uh, ignoring SBC, 14,000 will be service tax liability, 500 rupees will be SBC liability. Remember, Sinovac credit of SBC is not allowed. So, 14,000 should be credit available, but is it service provided by government or local authority to a business entity and the services assignment to use natural resources, Sinovac credit will be available in three equal installments. So year one, 14 upon 14,000 upon three, year two, 14,000 upon three, third year, 14,000 upon three. That will be the Sinovac credit. For example, A Limited enjoyed the right to use natural resources and they have reassigned it to B Limited. Now, 
for example they have reassigned it for 90000 rupees this invert credit which was available in the second year this invert credit which was available in the third year will become available 100% immediately ye bolta hai normally is it assignment to use natural resources then invert credit is available in three equal installment but if you reassign it to somebody else then balance invert credit will become available 100% but there is one limit in that not exceeding the service tax liability provided also that where the manufacturer of goods or provider of output service as the case may be further assign such assign such right assigned to him by government or any other person in any financial year to another person against consideration such amount of balance invert credit as does not exceed service tax payable so balance invert credit will become available to you immediately not in three installment but it is subject to condition that it does not exceed the total service tax liability so whatever service tax liability for example here total invert credit amount that was due what say for example 6 uh, 12000 rupees and service tax liability calculated in this transaction is 11000 rupees now 12000 will not become available balance invert credit will become available subject to not exceeding service tax liability so only 11000 will become available so here he says there are three important provisos amendments in 47 first important amendment is that period of one year is not applicable to services provided by government local authority or any other person to uh, anybody business entity normally which is in relation to assignment of right to use natural resources that one year period is not applicable secondly he says normally invert credit under 47 is available 100% but for this specified services it will be available in three equal installments and last he says if you further reassign that right balance invert credit will become available to you immediately but invert credit that will become available to you cannot exceed the total service tax liability little complicated this is so what i have done here what i have done here this all amendments are on page number 22 but what i have done here page number 23 and 24 and 25 in detail i have given cases examples with solution about how exactly the movement of invert credit will be i have put it i have made it so simple if you read it you will be able to answer any question please complete along with this 47 please complete study of page number 23 24 and 25 i have to bring one point to your notice the work which i have done 23 24 25 actually it is based on circular issued 19202 2016 service tax this circular i have kept it in the download section of my site whatever work i have done here is based on this circular but there are two important issues the circular is giving all examples including kkc krishi kalyan says but for our attempt kkc is not applicable so to that extent i have changed the content also i have given very simple example the examples given by circular are tedious you will uh, find it very difficult to complete that and to understand them i have converted them into very very easy examples but before doing that i have done two changes first of all kkc i have ignored krishi kalyan says i have ignored also one thing is terribly wrong in this circular while doing this circular by mistake they have taken sinvat credit of sbc which is not true so that error also i have corrected in my work my work is different from the circular in two respects one i have ignored kkc completely and an error in that circular where wrongly they have taken sinvat credit of sbc that i have already corrected please under uh, Uh, please understand this page number 23 24 and 25 some small mathematical questions we are expecting in the examination based on this exercise please complete everything up to page number 25 now i am on page number 26 there is one amendment in there are two amendments here on this page one amendment is in 45b and one amendment is in 46 let me explain you these amendments 
first of all what is 4 5 all about 4 5 a was talking about sending inputs or capital goods to a job worker please understand as a manufacturer I got I'm talking only about 4 5 not amendment 4 5 I got some inputs excise duty paid I got some capital goods excise duty paid I have avails in VAT credit but these inputs or capital goods I need to send to my job worker. For example, inputs ke upar job worker minus minor process karne wala hai. So, iske liye mere ko inputs uske paas bejne hai. Or capital goods may be required at job worker end for doing some processes. He is doing some processes for me and for that he requires those machines. So, I want to send my capital goods. Can I do this? 4-5 A is allowing me this. 4-5 bolta hai. Input ke baare mein baat karta. 4-5 bolta hai. Input aap job worker ke paas bej do. Let him do the process and let him send it back to you. If this is happening in 180 days, no Sinovac credit treatment is required. Normally, this would have amounted to removal of input as such and 3-5 would have become applicable. But 4-5 gives me special dispension. Wo bolta hai, inputs of excise duty paid of the one which you have taken Sinovac credit, you can send it to the job worker. No treatment to Sinovac credit is required, subject to condition let the job worker complete the process and inputs have to come back to you within 180 days. If they come back in 180 days, no treatment to Sinovac credit will be given. Had it been capital good, read this 180 days as 2 years. That is the amendment, with the amendment I have explained you 4-5. In fact, 4-5 may or be jada amendments the, which I have explained in my last lecture. That is the amendment which has taken place before uh, uh, 30th October that is last amendment lecture jo hai mera site ke upar usme aap ye amendment des, dek sakte ho 4 5 I have taught in detail there you know inputs can directly be sent to the job worker or even capital goods can be directly sent to the job worker let the job worker do the process and inputs have to come back to our factory and 180 days period is to be calculated from the day inputs reaches the job worker these are the amendments. Leave alone those amendments. Basically, 4 5 kya bolta hai? Inputs you receive in your factory, take Sinovac credit of excise duty, send the inputs to the job worker, let him complete the process. Input has to come back in 180 days. Usme aage bhi likha hai. Usme likha hai ki if they don't come back in 180 days, you have to give up relatable Sinovac credit. So, 181st day, if inputs have yet not come back, I have liability under rule 4-5 of Sinovac credit rule, my liability equal to amount equal to Sinovac credit that I have had. But for example, on 200 day inputs come back, whatever I have paid, I can again avail the Sinovac credit. That was 4-5, not required here, but just to revise, I have explained 4-5. 4-5, input we have to read it as 180 days, capital goods we have to read it as 2 years. That was 4-5. Now what is Four, that was 4-5-A. Now what is 4-5-B? First we understand the difference between the two. 4-5-A versus 4-5-B. What is the difference? 4-5, we are talking about inputs and capital goods. All inputs and all capital goods. 4-5-B is only talking about specific capital goods. 4-5-A, whatever you send has to come back in 180 days or 2 years, 4-5-B, whatever you send does not come back in 180 days or 2 years. 4-5-A, if you have sent inputs to your job worker, they have to come back in 180 days. If you have sent capital goods, they have to come back in 2 years. 4-5-B, the capital goods, the specific capital goods which you have sent to your job worker, they will never come back. Also, 4-5-A is talking about only job worker. 4-5-B, is talking about job worker and other manufacturer. पहले ये फर्क समझना तो 45 भी आसान हो जाता है। अभी 45 B without amendment मैं पहले explain करता हूँ। Principal manufacturer, job worker. Principal manufacturer has received 100 plus 10, 110. What is this? This is capital good and they are molds. 
mold dyes, jigsaw fixture, refractory, refractory material. He has received this capital good maybe 50-50, but he is going to avail in what rate of 10 rupees. Capital goods have come to his factory, but these capital goods, namely molds, are not required in his factory. They are required in job worker factory. He sends it to the job worker. Job worker used them in his manufacturing process, and in manufacturing process, they got exhausted. They never come back. Still, you can continue to enjoy in what credit. That is 45B without amendment. Now, usme ek amendment hai. Principal manufacturer hai. Supplier manufacturer hai. He is the supplier of molds. Job worker hai. Job worker requires certain molds, but we'll tell him directly to supply it at job worker's factory and send the invoice to us. Invoice will be like this: buyer. करके वो principal manufacturer का नाम लिखेगा. Consignee. करके वो job worker का नाम लिखेगा. Hundred plus ten, hundred and ten. Maybe fifty fifty, but invoice credit will be availed by the principal manufacturer. Job worker will get those capital goods in the nature of mold dyes, jigs, and fixtures. They get exhausted; they never come back. But still, we can continue to enjoy in what credit. Previously, 45B, apparently, it was necessary to receive molds in your factory and then send it to job worker. Now, 45B also has been amended. Even the molds can directly be sent. To the job worker, and you can avail in what credit. I know molds will never come back, but that does not matter. 45B in the amended form. The in what credit shall also be allowed to the manufacturer of final product in respect of jigs, fixtures, mold and dies, or tools falling under Chapter 82 of First Schedule to the Central Excise Act, sent by such manufacturer to another manufacturer for the production of goods. Or a job worker for the production of goods on his behalf, according to his specification, provided that such credit shall not be allowed where jigs, fixtures, mold and dies, or tools falling under Chapter 82 of First Schedule to Central Excise Tariff Act are sent. Provided that such credit shall also be allowed where jigs, fixtures, mold and dies, or tools falling under Chapter Chapter 82 of First Schedule to Central Excise Tariff Act are sent. By the manufacturer of final product to the premises of another manufacturer or job worker without bringing this to his own premises. Now, even you can tell supplier manufacturer to send the molds directly to job worker's factory, and if job worker is going to use them in manufacturing process, then still you can avail full sin what credit. So, 45B has been amended to send the molds directly to job worker's factory. Also, four six. If you remember, four six was saying something like this: principal manufacturer, hundred plus ten, hundred and ten. He has a wealth in what rate of ten rupees. Inputs have come to him. Job worker, principal manufacturer has sent inputs to job worker. Job worker has converted them into final product. Now, is it possible? That final product be directly be cleared from job worker's factory. Four six was allowing that. Four six बोलता है, if final products are ready at job worker's factory, directly from job worker's factory, you can clear them. You have to take permission from the commissioner, and permission once granted will be available for one year. That is what we have read without amendment. Here, four six I see that a financial year word has been deleted. Substituted by three financial years. So once the permission has been granted, it will be valid for three financial year. That is the amendment, page number twenty six four six has been amended, applicable from first March two thousand sixteen. That is the amendment in four five, now four five and four six. Then. I am on page number twenty-seven, rule five of Sinvat Credit Rules, which is talking about refund. If you are an exporter of service or exporter of goods, then you are supposed to make an application for refund of unutilized Sinvat Credit. Is there any time limit for that? 
refund application for Sinovac credit under Rule 5 within one year. But from what date? From receipt of payment. But if payment was received in advance, then within one year from issue of invoice. So one year ke liye relevant date kya hai? First of all, remember whatever is Sinovac credit available in your books, you are supposed to use it for your liabilities. If there is balance, you are supposed to carry it forward, but under no circumstances, refund of Sinovac credit will be allowed. That is the normal rule. But to this normal rule, there were three exceptions. Three exceptions where unutilized Sinovac credit will be allowed as refund. They were Rule 5, Exporter SSE, Rule 5A, Area Based Person and 5B, Partial Reverse Charge Person. In that, I am talking about Rule 5. I am on page number 27. If unutilized Sinovac credit remains in the books, Exporter SSE can complete certain procedure and get refund of unutilized Sinovac credit under Rule 5 of Sinovac credit rules. What is time limit for that? Here he says, within one year, we are talking about basically service within one year from receipt of payment and if payment was received in advance, then within one year of issue of invoice, which have, that is the uh, relevant date, from that relevant date within one year, you have to apply for the refund. Page number 27. <laughs> Other amendments here given in this book, uh, page number 27 was about uh, rule 5 of Sinovac credit rules, 6, 7, actually we have already completed. First you remember what is 6, 6. Normally what 6, 1 had said, normally what rule 6, 1 had said, 6, 1 said, I am getting some inputs excise duty paid and I am going to use those inputs for manufacture of final product and my final product is exempt then Sinovac credit is not available to me but 66 ne bola tha I am talking about 66 66 ne bola tha is your final product exempt because you are an exporter then 61 is not applicable to you in other words he is saying you are not paying excise duty and your final product has become exempt because you are exporter, then though you are not paying excise duty, still Sinovac credit will be available to you. We know what happens next. If I have some DTA clearances on which I have excise duty liability, I will end up using that. But if I have no DTA clearances under rule 5 of Sinovac credit rule, I will take refund of unutilized Sinovac credit. 6, 6 was saying the normal rule that if you are not paying excise duty, then you are not eligible for Sinovac credit is not applicable if the reason for not paying excise duty is export. That was 6, 6. What about 6, 7? 6, 7 was saying are you providing service to an SEZ and because SEZ has completed the procedure and because of that you are not paying any service tax then the reason why you are not paying service tax is service provided to SEZ then though you are not paying service tax still Sinovac credit will be available to you. So in that 6, 7 one more item has been added and that is or when service is provided or agreed to be provided by way of transportation of goods by vessel from custom station of clearance in India to place outside India. You are a shipping company you have provided a service of transportation of goods from Indian port to outside port by vessel. I know you are not paying any service tax because POP is destination of the goods. So which is outside India, I know in this transaction you are not paying service tax. That means your service is exam service. Normally, Sinovac credit should not be available. But as a special case, Still, rule 6.1 is not applicable to you and you can avail full Sinovac credit. I think along with the definition of exam goods, I already explained you this concept. In definition of exam services, also there was one amendment and exam service does not include a service provided of transportation of goods from a place port in India to port outside India. That was also amendment here and this just matches with that amendment. This is the amendment on page number 28.
पेज नंबर ट्वेंटी नाइन अ माइनर अमेंडमेंट इवन इफ सर्विस प्रोवाइडर इज क्लियरिंग गुड्स इनपुट्स और कैपिटल गुड्स फ्रॉम इज प्रिमाइसेस ही विल बी गिविंग इन वॉइस अंडर रूल थ्री फाइव ऑफ सिनवाइट क्रेडिट रूल वेदर दैट डॉक्यूमेंट ऑल्सो कैन बी अ बेस्ड डॉक्यूमेंट फॉर अवेलिंग सिनवाइट क्रेडिट रूल नाइन वन रूल नाइन वन इज बेसिकली टेलिंग अस बेस्ड ऑन वॉट डॉक्यूमेंट्स यू कैन अवेल सिनवाइट क्रेडिट दैट रूल नाइन वन हैज बीन इंक्लूडेड टू इंक्लूड डॉक्यूमेंट्स इश्यूड बाय सर्विस प्रोवाइडर now even if service provider is clearing input or capital good at such and he is giving invoice under rule 35 that invoice also now technically can become base for availing sinvat credit so very very technical amendment which is on page number 29 the most important amendment is in rule 14 based on which we are expecting a question what is rule 14 basically rule 14 says if you are availed wrong sinvat credit then we'll issue you show cause notice under section 11a excise ki baat kar raha hu and recover it from you rule 14 aage bolta hai if you are availed wrong sinvat credit and also you have utilized it then we'll issue you show cause notice under 11a and with interest under section 11a we'll recover it from you that is what basically rule 14 one is saying so only wrong availment recovery and if wrong availment and wrong utilization then recovery with interest that is basic section for uh, rule 14 one 14 2 was giving an order if you have utilized the wrong sinvat credit we will assume that you have utilized it in following order he says we will always assume that opening balance of sinvat credit you have used first then you have use eligible credit of the current month and last will assume that you have used ineligible credit of current month so 142 was giving a hypothetical assumption order in which sinvat credit is deemed to have been utilized but 142 has been omitted this has been omitted effective 14 2016 how it will change the mathematics i have given on page number 32 a question which i have solved based on old method that is with 142 on and new method that is having omitted 142 i think it is going to be self explanatory this kind of question is expected in the examination just have look at the problem think about the solution try to solve it in the old method try to solve it in the new method and then check the answer point to be noted one hypothetical assumption that in what capacity in what order you have utilized the sinvat credit which was given by 142 has been omitted now previously he was saying whenever you use sinvat credit we assume that first you you have used opening balance then you have used eligible sinvat credit of the current month and then you are using ineligible sinvat credit of the current month that order is gone so factually uh assess will always say always while utilizing i have used eligible sinvat credit first and that is going to change the mathematics of interest completely please find problem with solution on page number 32 page number 33 a very very simple amendment 11 a last time we said if you are paying excise duty late for whatever reason below the sun always you have to pay it with interest at the rate of 18% 18% was applicable rate up to 31st march 2016 from 14 2016 read it as 15% that is the amendment on page number 33 here after page 33 page 34 35 36 37 and 38 there are some amendments according to me they are not very relevant for you i have copy pasted them as it is from rtp nothing to value add from my side one reading of these amendments is recommended uh, i have copy pasted them as it is from rtp they have not been covered when i teach the subject and nothing much to value add please read it yourself 
these are the all amendments possible in exercise uh, thank you very much